Good morning. Good morning. And welcome this day that the Lord has made. Whether you be here in our sanctuary or online, I'm Elise Skiles, the lay leader at Mount Moriah here, 
And it's my pleasure to serve as the liturgist this day as Doug, our musical director and chair of creative arts, uh, is going to lead us all in the rest of the worship and share a message with us today. And so uh, he just has a problem, I guess, getting from the piano to here, to there, to there. I do. <laughs> so um, thank you, Doug, for asking me to do this for you and to share this worship experience with you. So if you would stand to join with me in our call to worship. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, who art my rock and my redeemer. Gracious words are like a honeycomb. Sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit has understanding. Let us join in singing our songs of praise. First one, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. children come on down or come on up oh come on up down oh, come on down right here <laughs> all right you guys look great today so today we are talking about idioms and that's a really complicated word 
An idiom is just something that you say because it has some wisdom into it. Wisdom is when you can say really smart things. So I'm going to give you one right now. I'm going to give you an idiom, and we're going to talk and see whether we think it's really working or not. So your idiom is, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Okay? So I want you to think about that. Have you ever heard that one before? Have you heard that one? Good. I'm glad to hear that. I would have been really, really sad for the rest of the service. Uh, um, So um, it means that that idiom says, listen, if you throw things or hit hit me, it's going to hurt, but you can say anything you want to me and it's not going to bother me. Does it hurt when somebody calls you a name or something? No. You're okay with it? I'm, I'm, really, I'm not really good with it. If, if someone sits around and says mean things about me, I think it hurts. I think it eventually hurts. I've thought about that for a long time. What I think it was meant to be is somehow protecting ourselves from not being hurt every time we hear something that's tough. But I think when it's all said and done, when we say mean things to people, I think it hurts the other person. Do you think so? Maybe a little bit? So when we, when we think about that idiom, we can say, well, we know that sticks and stones, if somebody hits us or pushes us, it hurts. But I don't think that idiom works very well. I think we need to be careful about what we say, too. Even if it doesn't hurt us now, we end up thinking about it later. Would you agree with me? Yes. That, that ultimately in the world right now, we have a lot of people saying a lot of things, and I think they're hurtful. So for today's study of idioms, I officially discount that one. We don't use that one anymore. We should use something like, when we meet and interact with people, we should be the hands of Christ. And if we do that, then everything we say and everything we do makes a lot more sense. Does that sound okay? If you ever have any question about whether you should say something or not, I'm Doug. Come up and ask me, and I can at least talk through and help you out, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, God, thank you so very much much for these children. children. They are the hope of the future. future. Please give them strength strength to know right from wrong wrong. wrong. and let all the things that they say and that they do do. be pleasing to you. you. In your wonderful name we pray. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys were fantastic today. I should have worn pink. I think everyone's wearing pink today, but I didn't wear pink. I didn't get the pink memo. That's correct.
us um, join together as we put our hearts and minds towards the time we lift each other up in prayer. Throughout the week, we have heard requests for prayer, and we've heard re some celebrations along the line. Mary Suttles requested prayers for Irma Lee, Jim's sister, who has entered into hospice care. Suzanne Allen asked for prayers for her brother-in-law, Joe, who was diagnosed with melanoma in his leg and lung and was going to start therapy. Charlotte's brother's father-in-law, Bob, uh, has been hospitalized with some heart issues and is in need of prayer. Renee Spaulding asked for prayers. She has some big ones. As her three-year-old three grandson, Alex, her daughter, Stephanie, and son-in-law, Alan Weber, all of them are home fighting COVID. Um, we are thankful that God uh, did prevail at the hospital when they took the little one in because his heart was racing so and his oxygen was so low. Um, they were able to give him medicines that allowed him to go home. But the family is struggling because mom and dad are sick and the little one is sick. And who's going to take care of them all? So just surround them all. Elizabeth Ramis's daughter, Nikki, in Colorado also has COVID, and she's trying to keep her husband and two young boys, and she's got little ones there too, healthy and away from her. Just tough on Mother's Day to do that too, folks. Um, prayers for Farron, a friend of Charlotte. He is celebrating a new grandson, which is a joy, but unfortunately he too has COVID and can't go to see that new little joy in his life. So we ask for prayers. Um, Mary Jean Crazy, I think. I'm not sure how to say that last name. I'm sorry if it's wrong. Passed away over the last weekend. Uh, she was one of our preschool and child care centers music teacher and a Spanish teacher for many years. Charlotte had that on the answering machine this week when she returned from her trip. And services were last week. And so we remember her, Mary Jean and her family. Linda Missman shared that she had her surgery on Wednesday. She was still a little foggy, but doing well, and we thank God for that. And then if you tried to call the office or stop by this week, you might have found notes on the door that said, I'm not here, I'm sick, I've gone home, call me. Charlotte indeed has been very much under the weather. When I came in Wednesday and saw her sitting in the office shivering, I said, it's time to go home and take care of you. And then she did the rest of this work, the bulletin and the slides, all remote, even when she was sick. So, Charlotte, we thank you for that. Please take care of yourself and get well. And she thanks us all for her prayers that we have lifted up for her. We know that God knows what all is in our hearts, those that we want to remember and those that we shout joys of praise for. And so we Pause a moment with silent prayer to put them before our Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us with your time together this morning. We thank you for wanting to perfect us, to confirm us and strengthen us and establish us. We are so blessed, Lord, to receive your love, your grace and mercy, and to have the opportunity to share it with you. Lord, help us to cleanse our hearts of malice and anger and deceit. Help us, Lord, to fill our lives with your righteousness. Your gift, O oh God, is not a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. Therefore, with complete confidence, we pray, send us your spirit that Christ may be born again today in our hearts of all mankind. Send us your spirit, O Lord, that we may be open and open our eyes of the blind 
and proclaim the good news of light and life. Send us your spirit that we may live peaceful lives and pure and blameless in your sight. Send us your spirit that our homes may be the pledge of a world redeemed. Lord God, keep our eyes focused on the new world filled with your righteousness that you have promised us. And may we live expectantly as children of the light. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever, so we may join together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's nice to be here this morning with you. I'd like to start off with just a real quick exercise. I'm going to ask you to repeat exactly what I do. You have to repeat exactly what I do. La, la, la. La, 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 la. La, 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 la. Bum, 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 bum. No! No! No, no, no! I asked you to repeat exactly what I did. It was an easy, simple instruction, and within 10 seconds, you blew it. <laughs> My name is Doug Heflin, and I'm here this morning to talk about idioms for the modern Christian. It's how funny, in certain situations arise, people do the craziest things. I once had a teacher who used swear words in classroom, and every time she did, she apologized and says, I'm so sorry, I don't think it just automatically comes out, just like bum, 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 bum. You knew what the instruction was, but the second you heard that cue, you automatically gave me uh, five cents on my coffee and donuts. The human brain is a complex system. It really is one of my favorite topics. I have, I have enjoyed my study of, of brain theory. Although great advancements have been made in trying to understand how the human brain works, <clears throat> many mysteries still exist. So, how does memory work? And why can we remember some things and can't remember some other things? Why does it change as we get older? Although they are almost exactly the same thing. Why does memory change at different points in our life? Why can't we remember our, why can we remember our first grade teacher's name but can't remember what we ate for breakfast this morning? In its simplest form, Tina go on and hit us with the perfect picture of the brain. Memory involves two systems. One system is the unconscious, more routine thought processes. The second is the more conscious, more problem-based thought processes. Memory refers to the continued process of information retention over time. It is an integral part of human con cognition since it allows individuals to recall and draw upon past events and frame their understanding and behavior within that present. Memory also gives individuals a framework through which to make sense of not only what's going on now, but what might happen in the future. There are three portions to memory. One is encoding, how the information gets into us. One is storage, where we keep it. And one is retrieval. It goes out. Over time, we are faced with similar events, similar moments that we have experienced over and over again. Those things that we do or say are ingrained quite deeply in us. We respond without thinking because we've had that response that uh, response to that scenario hundreds of times. If you do not believe me, when you brush your teeth the next time, 
pick up the brush with your other hand and brush your teeth. Uh huh. See, now you. Now, we live in a world that is divided and currently is at war with itself. The community of the world is in crisis. During these difficult times, attention must be paid to how we communicate with others. From the children's sermon, I believe that over my time, most of the hurt that I have felt has come from what people have said and not what people have done to me. During these difficult times, we have to pay attention to those things. Countries, states, cities, communities, schools, businesses, and even churches must be aware of how they communicate. The crisis of communication in some ways is a result of a world that is moving slowly and slowly away from a relationship with Jesus Christ. The more people rely on themselves to justify right and wrong, the bigger the mess is. People say things that they have always said without thinking about the possible reactions to others. This is a problem that I've had to deal with a lot of my life because I taught high school and middle school kids for 30 years, and I've worked in a church for 30 years. Did you know that the second to last verse of every hymn I've played for the last 30 years is softer than the last verse? Do you know why I do that? I do that so if you get lost and are start listening to the music, if you hear a soft verse, you can find your place. You guys knew that. You can find your place because the second to last verse will always be softer. And that way, if the music takes you somewhere and you want to kind of sing at the very end, you can listen to me put that cue in there. Now that I've said it, you'll notice it every single time. Unless I forget to do it, in which case, this is just a real mess of a 30 seconds I just wasted of your time. So how do we address the struggle between the unconscious, more routine thought process and the conscious, more problem-based thought? How could you have prepared so when I went da-da-da-da-da, you went da-da-da-da-da, bring it on, Doug, is that all you got? How can you prepare for that? So here's, I've created a test for this morning. It's not written, and you won't be punished if you fail. But here we go. The test has three segments. The historical context, the meaning of the idiom, and scriptural support. I will then tell you, in my opinion, whether it is a valid thing for us to say or not. These are seven things that you have heard people say over and over again. Here we go. Number one, the early bird gets the worm. It first appeared in 1617 in a group of Proverbs. The idiom has its origin in the 18th and 19th century as both populations and the ability to travel long distances have increased. In 1800, 83% of America worked in agriculture. That was in 1800, 83%. In 1900, 40% of America worked in agriculture. We currently have 1% of America working in agriculture. However, in April 2011, 35% of America had a smartphone. As of today, 85% of all Americans have a cell phone. Because texting and messaging and email have allowed the world to communicate 24-7 without any reason to wait until any other time in the day, waking up early to get the first rays of sunshine to start work might not apply anymore. From Matthew, we hear, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. God tells us that we should first seek his kingdom. If we do this, tomorrow will not be so scary, because God is in control. That means that whenever you wake up, praise the Lord. In a world that never stops, this means that God is there for you 24-7. Test results. I no longer believe that this idiom is up to date. Although the concept of hard work is always true, I would recommend replacing that with Scripture. Of course, I've also heard the expression, the early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. That will be for a different sermon another day. Here we go. Second idiom. 
Let's see if this one still applies. Never look a gift horse in the mouth. And that, that cartoon is Charlotte's work, and she has done a fine job. I like that one. In olden days, and it probably is still true, checking out the dental history of a horse allowed the buyer to know if the horse was too old or not healthy. In the year 400, St. Jerome wrote the le- a letter to the Ephesians and stated, never inspect the teeth of a given horse. In 1546, John Hayward wrote in his book, now here's a, here's a good one, dialogue containing the number and effect of all proverbs in the English language. I'll wait till that comes out in a comic book. Um, no man ought to look a genuine horse in the mouth. John Hayward also is responsible for many hands make light work, and Rome wasn't built in a day. In recent large-scale studies, scientists tried to measure gratitude. So gratitude is a subjective concept, very difficult to measure. Just like saying that song was beautiful, but beautiful is completely subjective. It just comes from our opinion. So they ran a test study trying to put objective uh, results. Here are their results. In this study, one act of kindness made a difference in 85% of the people in this study. 10% showed the increase immediately, and 35% stated they felt less depressed. Studies with 8 to 11-year-olds proved that the group with positive feedback had longer-lasting and increased levels of happiness and gratitude. When employees were tested as to happiness in their job, an overwhelming majority of happy workers stated that their supervisor's positive approach had the most significant impact on their happiness. From Philippians, we hear, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Last weekend, I went to my Aunt Cecilia's uh, memorial service in Indianapolis. Uh, At that time, the pastor revealed, uh, unbeknownst to most of us, that in the last few years of her life, she decided she wanted to be grateful for everyone around her. She started writing notes of encouragement. Apparently, in the last few years of her life, she wrote over 1,200 notes, but nobody around her knew she was doing it. Over 1,200. The test results... This idiom is absolutely still relevant and usable. It supports scripture and reminds us all that kindness and gratitude are always relevant and they're always applicable. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. This idiom has been around now for 600 years. It went originally like this. It is more certain to have a bird in your fist than to have three in the blue sky. In the Wycliffe Bible in 1382, Ecclesiastes 9 said, A living dog is better than a dead lion. (laughs) I'm just going to trust that that's correct and move on. The bird in hand became a popular name for pubs in England, and there is even a town in Pennsylvania named the bird in hand. The original Rome, uh, or the origin of this bromide is actually biblical. In Ecclesiastes 6, we hear, A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Mere dreaming of nice things is foolish. It's chasing the wind. A number of years ago, I made the decision to never wish a moment away. So I got rid of two things from my life. I wish this day was over. And I... I stopped wishing for a day in the future. I wish it was summer. I wish it was fall. I wish it was Christmas. Because I felt like I was cheating myself of what might happen on that day. And it took a couple years to get rid of it out of mind. Because da, 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 was so ingrained in my mind that I would say, oh, I just wish this day was over. And I would immediately wish those hours away. 
because I know at different points in my life, here in a month or so, I get to travel to Virginia to meet my newest granddaughter, Penelope. I don't wish any time away because in the future, I might want to cash that time back in to spend more time with Penelope. In short, being grateful for each day and the blessings that a day is worth, absolutely still relevant. This bromide is wonderful. It supports scripture. It is scripture and reminds us that each day presents us with things and people and ideas that are blessed. Being grateful for those things is essential to a happy life. So we've kept two and we got rid of one. Let's go to number four, Tina. Slow and steady wins the race. Okay. (laughs) As the saying goes, Slow and steady wins the race. But where does this term come from? It actually is an Aesop's fable. And it comes from 2,000 years ago, over 2,000. The lesson was supposed to teach and learn us that pacing yourself remain even keeled through your journey. Have you ever been on a highway going the speed limit and the people around you, the traffic was going so fast that you going the speed limit was probably more dangerous than you going 10 miles an hour over. Interesting concept. Um, This fable has always struck me wrong. Not a big fan of this one. Most of the things that I've accomplished in my life have come because I've worked at most most efficient. We usually think slow and steady wins the race as the turtle and the, the tortoise and the hare. And what happens in the tortoise and the hare is that the turtle starts hum, ba-dum, 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 and walks the entire race. The rabbit takes off way in the lead, stops, takes a nap. The tur- turtle uh, passes the rabbit, the turtle wins. And the less is slow and steady wins the race. But there is no way that I would have played with the Cincinnati Symphony in high school if I would have been a tortoise in my preparations for my music career. It wouldn't have happened. Um, I don't believe that slow and steady always wins the race. I do believe slow and steady has its place in my life. Being able to take an afternoon and take on a walk, have it not knowing or caring how far you go, I believe that has a lot of validity. Our society struggles with this proverb. The pace of the word is much faster than the tortoise. Have you ever received a phone call from somebody 30 minutes after they sent an email asking if you had read the email yet. See, what happens is that our pace now is so fast that we have technology to send it immediately. Then we have other technology to make sure you're paying attention to this technology to make sure you're keeping up. There is a saying that says, if you want to be an expert at something, you need to spend 10,000 hours at it. Has anyone ever heard that? 10,000 hours. If you want to be an expert, 10,000 hours. So, what would happen if you, you have so many gifts in an area that after 2,000 hours, you're an expert? What do you do with the rest? And what I believe is that if we have a pace that works for us or if we are accomplishing what we want to do, we have to expect more out of ourselves rather than stopping and taking a nap. Trying to remind myself and trying to watch more sunsets, however, is probably one of my goals. I might be more of a rabbit than a tortoise. In Ecclesiastes, we hear... There is nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for these gifts are from God. My test results on this. The test results of this idiom are mixed. Sometimes being the tortoise will allow us to enjoy the journey, to enjoy the day. Sometimes we are called to be the hare. If we are capable of great things, then we should expect these great things from ourselves. Maybe the hare's problem wasn't the pace. It was choosing to take the nap and expecting too little of themselves. Next, Tina. You can't judge a book by its cover. (laughs) 
This idiom is actually rather new. It first appeared in 1944 and in 1946 in a movie Murder in the Glass Room by Lester Fuller and Edwin Rolfe. The phrase, don't judge a book by its cover, means that you shouldn't make a judgment about someone or something, be it a book or otherwise, based solely on their or its outward appearance. After all, a cover of a book may be boring without images or illustrations, but the content might be amazing. If you want to watch something extremely cool, go to YouTube, Y-O-U-T-U-B-E. There is a gentleman who goes and learns really odd things almost forgotten languages, and then goes to visit the people. So he'll learn something from the people of Nepal. Then he'll go into Nepal, and they just think it's the most wonderful thing that he will walk in and suddenly start talking their language. That it's just it's just a beautiful thing. Every person that sees them expects him to be one thing. Then he starts speaking their language. You should see the transformation that they go through. Every person he talks to suddenly changes. It's like, I would have never guessed. I expected so little, and then you have come through. It's amazing. In Matthew 25, we hear, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes to clothe you? When did you see a sick person or a person in prison and and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Test results. This idiom is still usable and relevant. It supports scripture and reminds us that we are all children of God, loving each other, giving generously to each other while still holding each of us accountable is deeply rooted in the teachings of Christ. Next one, Tina. That ship has sailed. Are, are you recognizing a lot of these from things you've heard and said through time? All right. That ship has sailed. It's too late. The origin of the, the picture of the person standing on the dock as the boat leaves the dock. All you can do is stand there because you missed the boat. In many ways, this is the most, one of the most discouraging idioms. It means that whatever's going on, whatever timing it is, you're too late. Now, when I graduated with my undergrad, I could have moved to Wyoming and become an antelope rope uh, ranger. I don't even know if there's such thing as an antelope ranger, but I could have. I could have gone out there and lived that. While oftentimes life presents us with moments where a decision can't be changed... This idiom is a little bit black and white. So do we identify times when we think we can't go back and ultimately we could have? Do sometimes say, don't worry about it. I already missed that. Let's go on. I wonder how often that is actually true. In Romans 12, we hear, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Remember, God offers us a chance to become a new person in Christ. Hopelessness becomes when, comes when we believe that every problem we have is a port where the ship has already sailed. While there will always be things that happen in our lives that cannot be changed, oftentimes when we think differently and see differently, we can get different results. What would happen if Mount Moriah made a decision that our greatest days as a church are in front of us? I might not be able to be a 22-year-old antelope ranger, But I can learn to study antelope. I can volunteer at animal rescue stations in the West. I can donate to the causes to help antelope population. And I can dedicate part of my life in supporting the next generation of antelope rangers. It's easy to see our lives as us standing on a dock. Through scripture, we can see that through relationship with Christ, that we can be renewed over and over again. As long as we have a breath, We can be renewed. After all, if we wait until we die, 
well, that ship has already sailed. <laughs> oh, I thought that was a good one. <laughs> this, this idiom is usable, but only in a certain context. It does not replace a living faith where our lives can be renewed at any time. And here's the last one. Mother knows best. Referring to, you kind of curious about what I'm about to say, Mary. See, you had mentioned that. Referring to maternal instinct and wisdom, a phrase often used by a mother or mother figure to give advice to their children or after their predictions have come true. Although the expression father knows best became popular with the TV show in the 1950s, mother knows best was actually used 30 years earlier. Mother Knows Best it was a novel written by Edna Ferber. So the, the only expertise I have in this world is looking at my mother. Uh, she shares from her personal experience, hoping that I somehow avoid the pitfalls of life. She loves unconditionally. She's a good listener, even when I make no sense. She remains and always will remain my mother. On occasion, she lets me try to teach her technology, and she has not hit me yet. <laughs> Ephesians 6 says, As for children, obey your parents in the Lord, because it is right. The commandment, honor your father and mother, is the first one with a promise attached, so that things will go well for you, and your will, you will live a long time in this land. In Proverbs, we hear, She is vig vigilant of the activities of her household, she doesn't eat the food of laziness. So what are the test results? Respect and love for those around us who are trying to help us better ourselves hold a place of worthiness and importance. There will always be a need for students and teachers. Perhaps we both get to be both in our lifetimes. I do know one thing. The current world does not know best. The news stations do not know best. The internet and social media do not know best. Still, this idiom passes. So, Mount Moriah, as we enter the summer season of 2022, our world, community, and church will be called upon to talk and discuss very important issues with each other. Being able to talk and discuss issues from the portion of the brain that is the more conscious, more problem-based thought process will be very important. In addition, remembering that it is the love of Christ that brings us all here together. Avoiding reactionary conversations will allow us to have the free exchange of ideas and opinions. And please don't get me wrong, this is not always easy. I do know one thing about conversation. Um, a conversation goes better when, as you're in it, you do something more than th talk and then think about what you're going to say. Because when you have a conversation like that, what's missing? Hearing. We stop listening. In summation, here are some possible takeaways from this morning's talk. Be gracious. Be on time. Reach out to others in a timely manner. Be nice to antelope and gift horses. <laughs> Say thank you. Be a better listener than a good talker. Start with the end in mind. Allow the word of God to guide you rather than the word of man. Avoid harsh judgments and greed. Don't take naps during the race. Look for more sunsets. And most importantly, be nice to all the mother figures in your life. Apparently, they were always right. Thank you. Thank you, Doug, for that inspiring message. Um, gives me a lot of food for thought, and I'll chew on it later. <laughs> It's the best I could do. Oh, I was listening I like to that. you. Good. Um, it is time for us to respond to the gifts and glory and blessings God has given to us. So we will 
ask our ushers to come forward. And if you're here in the sanctuary or we are so easily distracted by sinful temptations. Give us wisdom to see the things that the evil one has designed for us and avoid them and resist them. We know the costly sacrifice our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. As we seek to be your holy children in the chaos of this world in which we live, help us to be your hands, feet, and voice as we offer these gifts back to you for your use in this world. Bless and multiply them, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will join in singing our closing song.
take our leave of this place, I just lift up some of the opportunities for you to be in service this week or things that are coming up. Next Sunday is Holy Communion Sunday. Our, we will receive our communion offering. The information there is in our bulletin, our worship guide. There's a new Bible study starting, and it's starting May 19th. It's running through Thursdays, mornings, and evenings. There is a sign-up sheet out in the narthex. Books for that are also available there. Uh, if the Thursday's time don't, doesn't work for you, uh, Mon Wednesday mornings, the women's Bible study, the women will allow men to join them in Bible study on Wednesday morning. <laughs> Sylvia will welcome them. We have had some men along the way, so feel free to not wish, miss that opportunity to look further into the ascension. The golf um, outing is coming up. <clears throat> We're look <coughs> excuse me. We're looking for information on any graduates that are coming up. Um, so please make sure that gets into our church office so we don't miss anyone. A key piece, there is an immediate opening, not only for classroom teachers, but for our preschool director. Uh, the qualifications and information are listed in our worship guide. Ice cream social's coming, put that on your calendar. And then there is handouts there in the as you go out. There is a free dinner and movie this Thursday night, the 13th. So uh, we're going to watch uh, Pixar's Brave. The Ark is providing the pizza and drinks. And then there'll be popcorn and other goodies along the way, salad and dessert for some of us older folks that don't want all that pizza. That's what it says to say. <laughs> uh, so the, we're, we're ready. I just need some help. Um, Natalie's put this into place with Becky. I need some help to make it happen at this end. So if you can help me, please speak to me after. It's We're going to gather around 6 for the dinner, 6.30 for the movie, so we hopefully will have you all out and for those little ones that need to be home by 8 o'clock and for us older folks that need to be home too. <laughs> so please let me know. So there's lots of opportunities to share and to be God's hands and feet this week. So receive this blessing as we go. Christ before us, Christ behind us. Christ beneath us, Christ above us. Christ on our right, Christ on our left. Christ when we lay down. Christ when we sit up. Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of us. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of us. Christ in the eyes that see us. Christ in the ear of those that hear us. As we go forth this day, may Christ be with us this day and each of our days. Amen.